Thank you for tuning in to today's TLDR episode of the Breaking Changes podcast. I'm your host and chief evangelist for Postman, Ken Lane. With Breaking Changes, we explore topics from the world of APIs, but looking at it through the lens of business and engineering leadership. Joining me today, we have Desiree Vargas Wrigley, CIO and Executive Director of TechRise by P33 Chicago, and she's also the founder of Give Forward and Pirashoot. Desiree really opened my eyes to the innovation that's occurring within Chicago, and I helped widen her view of the role that APIs play in empowering local startups to make a bigger impact. Well, let's dive in and let's start with the basics. Who are you and what do you do? I'm Desiree Vargas Wrigley, and I am the Chief Innovation Officer and Executive Director of TechRise by P33. But prior to that, I was a, a two-time founder. Um, I am one of Chicago's few Latina founders that have raised over a million dollars. I think there's only three of us. My first company is was Give Forward. It was one of the first crowdfunding platforms. We helped people raise about $200 million and ultimately joined uh, GoFundMe. And then my second company, Parachute, is a kids' activity marketplace that some people may have seen on uh, Shark Tank a few years ago. So lots of startup experience. <laughs> Exciting. Yeah, the, the startup world and enabling folks to, to build that next generation of tech is is a pretty key. Uh, I think a lot of people associate it with Silicon Valley, but uh, there's a lot of energy and momentum in, in to doing it locally, right? Yeah. In Chicago, really, you know, our national reputation, I don't think is keeping pace with what's actually happening here. And that is um, that we have just an explosion of funding and startups. I think we did $7 billion last year in, in venture capital in Chicago. And I think we were the fastest growing venture market in the country, which you know, most people just don't realize. And then, you know, I think more importantly, we actually are the number one city in the U.S. for early stage funding for black and Latino founders with, I mean, it's only 13%, but compared to the rest of the country where it's like 1.9%, we are seeing meaningful growth. So what, what type of tech companies are you seeing emerge? So Chicago historically has been kind of a fintech SaaS and food delivery uh, place. And so anything consumer was tough. Anything that um, kind of served an audience that wasn't the typical kind of 1% or, or, you know, kind of cool white male audience wasn't, was difficult to fund. Um, but now we're seeing a lot, a range. I mean, there's definitely a lot around consumer fintech in Chicago just because of our history with, uh, you know, the board of trade and, and how many, um, banks we have in Chicago. There's also a lot around um, logistics and supply chain, which now is extending into um, food tech and ag tech. So I would say we are kind of a, a silent but uh, aggressive in, in space for, for anything in climate and sustainability. Actually, Valor's Fund just has a new sustainability fund that they're doing in partnership with Starbucks. And that's, I think, a $200 million fund here in Chicago just focused on sustainability. So lots happening there. And then we're actually the number one place for quantum research. Um, so we are, you know, thinking about what does it look like a decade or two decades from now um, to be the potentially the world leader in quantum? What does that mean from startup perspective, from a funding perspective, and from the type of um, corporate partners that we'll see come to Chicago for that work? So it sounds like, I mean, that's quite a spread of, of, building on the existing base of what is Chicago, serving the needs of what real world Chicago folks need, but also an eye towards the future, investing in quantum computing in other areas. That sounds like a pretty sustainable spread of, of investment. Yeah, we hope so. And um, it's also really exciting just to see that it's not, I mean, there are, 35% of our startups are started by women. Um, you know, women are 45% of the working population. So we still have a way to go for parity on that. But it really is becoming a very representative and inclusive startup ecosystem, which I think means we're going to see a lot of new scaled businesses that are in consumer, um, in health tech, in, in, you know, fintech focused on women that are going to come out of Chicago over the next few years. Those real world needs that that w women and, and from underserved portions of the population are going to need when it comes to fintech and healthcare and and so like what are what are some examples of of that that you're seeing on the ground? Yeah, I mean we're seeing everything from like an insert in um a, like a sports shoe for uh, one of our students here at IIT is developing um, a smart soul that can help 
athletes, student athletes, you know, um, better train, but also avoid pain and injury. Um, so, you know, we're seeing like the hardware side of things, we're seeing things in like, um, hydrogen storage and making that more efficient for the trucking industry. We're seeing, um, something like crypto mom, which is bringing, uh, crypto basically kind of doing what stash or acorns did for the general population, but making it crypto more accessible for, um, young women. We're seeing um, a mental, me lots of happening in mental health, actually. So um, Alchemy is working on mental health support for um, Black Americans, and Stigma is doing asynchronous video support for uh, Gen Z and millennials to, you know, have better on-demand health, uh, mental health support. So there's so many. I mean, we work with like 250 startups. I'm, I'm not doing a great job. Uh, Rhetoric yeah. is a really cool new tool that is um, basically like you can film yourself in on loom but then you can get um crowdsourced feedback on your pitches so you can use it for your startup or you can use it for your sales pitch or kind of anything that you need to refine over time yeah and as long as as long as there's value in what's being delivered i mean we're getting food to our home from a restaurant from a grocery store we're getting the thing the entertainment the experience the things that matter to us that 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 uh and matter to us locally i would say in, in our actual everyday lives then we're fine paying those fees and seeing how it works. Um, but we're going to have to, the apps are going to have to figure out how to democratize this a little bit more than I think the last round. So I'm hopeful if we get the right founders that, that we're going to be able to find that balance. I agree. One of the things I've been really uh, beating a drum about lately is, you know, we have this, you know, American express kind of shop local Saturday kind of, we know about shopping on main street, uh, but in a city like Chicago, we actually don't know what startups are here to buy from, and we're not buying from our local startups. And even if the startups just bought from each other, it would <laughs> amplify sales so much. So we're working on something, um, it's not built yet, but called shopshy.org, um, where people can just easily see what startups they can purchase from in Chicago, from consumer to B2B SaaS, you know, for their businesses. So I actually could yeah, probably use your guys' help in figuring out how to make that a streamlined experience. So maybe I'll. Yeah, yeah. No, it'd be interesting to see. Yeah, that's is another one. So we, aside from this show, you and I have been kind of brainstorming on other ways of telling the story of of not just local Chicago startups, but the 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 existing APIs or solutions that would make that that can be used and leveraged. So calendaring um you mentioned you know video some of the video and social aspects and influencer so i think there's a a, a lot a huge opportunity to just showcase existing apis and existing tools um but be more transparent about who the founders are where they're located and and have that solidarity among founders and and whether it's b2b or b2c uh encourage folks to support each other yeah absolutely um, and it is, you know, so one of the trends that we see for first time founders, you know, kind of moving into this topic more is that um, we see founders thinking that they have to build everything from scratch. Like they have to build a calendar tool, like it, it, like it doesn't exist. And so I'm going to build this app to solve the problem. When really the, the truth is that you need a great developer who knows about all of the different resources or as many as they can, or is willing to do the research to figure out what APIs and third party tools are out there that you can kind of put together, especially at the MVP stage. But then I would also argue like, as you continue down your product roadmap, looking at third party tools to speed up the process and lower your costs. And it's just getting, you know, more and more affordable to build, to build new things when you do it this way. Um, and, and so we're really trying to encourage our founders to think differently. In fact, we have a, a grant from Verizon to help founders think about what, what you have technical consultations and think about, you know, what existing technologies are out there already, but also how can they think about things like 5g in, in, their build and not be constrained by the, the old kind of capacity limits that were there. So. I think that's an important one. I think so. That's I think we'll continue. We're working on a calendaring uh, kind of narrative right now uh, for this other storytelling. But I think building uh, directories or networks where people can a learn about the existing APIs that exist because uh, you should not be reinventing the wheel. Some wheels you can't reinvent. Mapping. That's a that's a tough one. You you should use Google Maps or Mapbox or one of these others. But then also, so what are the core resources that you should be using when it comes to payments and other things that 
aren't always available locally, but then what are the local resources that you can use that um, are going to maybe augment these calendaring apps and, and make appointment and scheduling much more easier or more specific to whatever industry you're working in? So what's the local component? And then where are the gaps and, and give maybe give voice to these fat local founders a little bit more to go man, if I just had something that would aggregate my calendaring or do my payments in this way and then give opportunities for other people to step up and fill in those cracks locally and provide those solutions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, those gaps end up being really big businesses when people fill them in, especially when it's B2B. So, you know, just from like a, a new business creation perspective or a new product element, yeah, having that conversation is really smart. You're giving me a lot of ideas. I'm actually, you know, now I'm going to organize something with some of our startups. To be like, well, what problems are we solving manually still that we could be better solving with APIs and existing technology? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, part of what you're you're grooming people to to be ready for when it comes to being startup founders, what they need to learn and do and, and understand is one of them is it doesn't have to be the next Facebook or massive startup. It could be a a, a micro startup that is providing, you know, connecting the dots in a special way, in a meaningful way that really augments uh, an existing API or solution. So one thing that folks don't understand about APIs a lot of time is, is talent acquisition is, is one of the number one reasons for having an API. So like PayPal, these other companies who are pretty big and established, they have an API because they can watch who uses their API and what they're building with the API. And they go, well, you know what you're doing. Clearly you already know our platform or know our product. You seem motivated. You built this really cool tool or plugin or extension that connects the dots and you already have people using it. Well, why don't we just hire you? And so talent acquisition is the number one reason for having an API for companies. And so, this seems like an, an area that we could educate and inform potential startup founders to go, hey, look, just build interesting things in Stripe's ecosystem, in Twilio's, and get and solve a real world problem that you face in your world. And then someone's going to notice. That's such a good point. And I, I hadn't thought about it from a talent acquisition perspective, but as you were talking, I was like, also from an MA perspective, like, it mm -hmm. seems, you know, if you want to have a few double singles triples in a few you know lots of zeros in your bank account it seems like a very low cost way to get to get acquired so smart well it's i mean that's why facebook acquired instagram guess who was the number one image platform in the in the facebook ecosystem it was instagram yeah. so they acquired them so yeah this is this is a great way to it doesn't have to be its own standalone app it can be a browser extension it could be a plugin it could be um, so getting creative, it's like you said earlier, we have enough apps on our phone, you know, get creative in how you're actually solving problems. It doesn't have to be a full blown platform or app. So, so yeah, well, uh, maybe we should explore this as part of our further conversations and see what we can, what we can drum up. Yeah, absolutely. One of, so, um, you know, the kids activity platform parachute that I have, um, it, there's, it's winding down, unfortunately, but, uh, you know, just a victim of COVID and and a really messy cap table. But as you're talking and we've been talking before, you know, thinking about if I had built it first as an API first tool. Um, so I don't know if we want to get into it now, but um, listeners might not know much about the kids activity space, but it's a $170 billion a year spend category for families and there's no marketplace for it. So it's you know, a pretty massive opportunity if it's if done correctly. But the, the challenge of the industry is that unlike um, you know, in restaurants or something where open table or toast are kind of predominant, there's no single registration platform or software. There's about 200 different registration platforms and softwares all operating on different code, very few of which have APIs and almost none have open APIs. So to be able to aggregate that data is very difficult. And so it was very hands-on going, to, you know, settling to each individual provider. Um, but if, but once we had all the information, if we'd had an open API, we actually could have gotten so much more um, volume of visitors through the, this like explosion that is the mom blog sites that have all these calendars on them that they're all making themselves in WordPress. And, and so if anyone's listening, you should take this and then come ask me for funding so I can fund you because I, hmm. I can't build it right now, but I would love for the problem to be solved. 
Yeah, that seems like a pretty big opportunity for like a because uh, like Plaid uh, in in the banking industry, there's not a lot of APIs because there's a lot. Well, there's a growing number of APIs, but they're they're not open APIs, as you said. They're they're closed APIs, and they don't want you to give access to them because they see the data being critical. So Plaid started doing a lot of scraping, and and that's a kind of the the dirty secret of the 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 fi fintech space is you have to scrape a lot of this um, from people's banking account screens and stuff. And so it sounds like there would be opportunity like that for in in, in this space for someone to come through and and connect the dots on some of these providers. But you touched on API first being the, a, a really critical piece is it's as a startup founder, it's difficult. You're going to have to pivot. You're going to have to at some point change and shift and evolve to find that market fit. And if you're API first, that's much easier to do that than if you just built your, your identity around a mobile app or something. So being API first, using other existing APIs or scraping um, or creating what's called scrape APIs is a very, very common way of starting a starting a business until you get some traction and then you can build your front end and do a lot more. And that's the Twilio model. That's the Stripe model. Um, it just needs to be applied in other areas that matter. So I have a question for you slash, I guess, the audience that they can't answer, but how do founders find experts in APIs? Because, you know, they're not thinking that way. They're thinking about who can build this, the vision that I have that's going to touch the consumer. And they're not thinking that the other part is scary and unknown and, um, and they don't know if they're finding someone good. So, I mean, where do you find great API That's experts? a great question, and I do not have a good answer for you. There is not any good way to understand and find people who are ex experts in API. I've been, I've spent a decade trying to cultivate folks who are mm -hmm. specialists in healthcare or environment, or because there's APIs in in many different disciplines, but you need that evangelist that person who knows and, and well you should be using this when or when it comes to sms twilio is great but hey there's also these providers and depending on your needs you know can help you uh find the solution that you need and then i i really like your idea of the local component it's like well shop use your local apis or at least regional um that maybe aren't you know built in another country or or totally out of state and so there isn't any good one, any good way of doing that. And that's a problem. I need to, it's something I need to work on. Yeah. If you could like filter your directory by location, that'd be, it seems like a okay. first step, right? Add it to your list of things that you need to do. So I was very lucky with Parachute that, um, you know, when we first built, we were using outside devs, but um, we kind of aqua hired a competitor out of San Francisco. And the CTO there was on the API team at PayPal prior to starting. So we did, you know, we tapped into a, a few, including the group on API to be able to bring meaningful content onto the site. Um, but it was, um, it was so hard receiving all of this data and, um, you know, things broke all the time, especially with like the mind body API that is like 800 years old. So I'm also curious, like, you know, how do we put pressure on people with these APIs to make them more stable so that they're truly usable by the community? Wow, you're such a great uh, person to interview for this podcast because, I mean, that's the notion of breaking changes is breaking changes is 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 the the pop the most popular notion of it is is Mark Zuckerberg saying move fast and break things, and which is great sounding when you're in in maybe in VC circles or, or young white male circles and you're building a startup. But when you're people who are dependent on that API for your for your local business and you have to keep up with that, those changes and then those breaking changes are uncommunicated changes. And it's actually a uh, kind of a strategic tactic is those who are able to keep up with me as a startup who are dependent on our resources, those are the ones who win. And those are usually ones who are inside my inner circle of partners. So we we're talking to that group and letting them know, hey, wink, wink, our API is going to change and you're going to have to change your code. You're going to have to. But those mm -hmm. who are not in the circle don't get that. And you end up with an unreliable, untrustworthy API. So 
this is partly technical and that's what postman does is help people um, test and make your api more reliable monitor it and understand it but it's also business and politics and and how you and this is what facebook is being investigated by the ftc right now for is their uh, anti-competitive practices in their api ecosystem most notably instagram and whatsapp so this is what we do and this is one of the areas that i'm trying to focus on and i mean it's why i ended up talking to you and this is uh is is it how do you build apis that that compete at this level and and build startups that compete with this because there's a lot of anti-competitive practices and we need more people in these api ecosystems aware of the apis using them building on them and so i would say for for any of your startup founders i mean one, you and I should work on more storytelling around how to get people more API aware. But if there's a resource you need, Google it plus API, the word plus API. So if it's payments, search for payments API. If it's calendaring, search for calendaring API. Look at those companies. Uh, do your due diligence on, on, on who they are. A lot of these are available in the Postman API network. You can find them. But look around the community because there's usually going to be someone in the community that's knowledgeable. Um, active on the forums, active on Twitter, identifies in some way, hey, I, I work on Shopify's API and self-identifies and get to know those people. But I think we need a lot more work to educate people about APIs, why they matter, why they're important, um, especially at the, even at the local level. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, you know, something that you said is uh, critically important to maybe some reason that people are scared of APIs is the, the business decisions around opening and closing access, right? So when Eventbrite uh, took off their API access for like anyone that wasn't Facebook or had a certain level of sales, we lost a ton of inventory on, on Parachute, which was, you know, disappointing, of course, to our customers and to us. And there was no other way for us to get, I'm sure but that's not true. We probably could have scraped and did something fancy, fancier than I was capable of, of leading at the time. Um, but, you know, going back uh, probably eight years when with Give Forward, when our, the crowdfunding platform that I helped build, we were so dependent on Facebook for our traffic because that's how people promoted their fundraisers. And, you know, we, we benefited from Facebook so much because as Facebook transitioned from, you know, static posts to a feed and a wall, you know, from a wall to a feed, um, we, that's, we saw a lot of growth in our business and so grateful for that time. But when they turned us off or basically, you know, deprioritized anything that looked like fundraising, we lost half of our revenue in a month. And, you know, yeah. it's Facebook. So of course they don't care about, you know, small businesses like ours. I mean, we're 5 million a year in revenue, not that small, but, but small relatively. Um, it, it can have a really damaging effect. And so knowing who your customers are of your API and thinking about ways to transition them, warn them better, you know, is, is definitely a responsibility that comes with the power of an API. Well, I think this is something, this is something you and I are going to have to tackle in the storytelling we're doing outside of this show is there's the last wave of API startups or tech startups. It was all, as I see it as APIs have been built on the backs of, um, so think of it like the, the early environmental and mining and extractive, uh, resource. So trees mining, they, these large companies went around to small towns, mined their forests, forests, hired the people, built up these communities, and then left and left a lot of people destitute. So what's happened in the digital economy is Google Maps went around and said, hey, we have this open and free service. Please, everyone use it. Put your data in it. Local communities embed your map. Oh, hey, Facebook. Yes, yes. Build your networks. Build your groups. Do your calendaring. Do your groups. And Eventbrite. Yes. Hey, manage your events. So all of these went around and got local people dependent, doing the work, building that data that made them a platform, that made them a growing concern. And then when it didn't matter anymore... You just turn off the switch to those people and you focus on the partners that matter. And so one of the things that I've always been a big advocate for is, and I would like to do more, is the local ownership and the local stewardship of startups and what you, what, what you, your fund and what you've been representing. But at an API level is we should own the local data. We should own uh, all the mapping, all the business, all the events, all the things that should be 
available via APIs that are locally owned and operated, maybe using open source software like Eventbrite, but open source or uh, some yeah. sort of social network, but open source. But then local stewards own that, run that. And then the big companies who want access to it can come and pay those local providers access to their data and use it. It should have happened in the reverse, but it didn't because we didn't really see it coming. And okay. so I think that's that's where I would like to go with you next as far as storytelling is continue that um, and and really get that solidarity among local Chicago folks understanding this, that, you know, what's needed here. That'd be great. And maybe I can bring on one of the founders of Event Noir, who is a competitor to Eventbrite and um, specifically focused on um, black community culture and arts. And, and, you know, I don't know that they're building with this in mind. So maybe we can kind of like real time discuss why this is necessary and just get their perspective and, and have that kind of aha moment if they haven't already started thinking about it. Yeah, no, I mean, helping founders understand this. I think that's this. It seems like that's going to be mining, mining years mission here coming out of this relationship, but continuing educating um, about the local nature as well and the importance of local ownership and stewardship and, and then APIs being part of that, that, there's a lot of predatory or and there's a lot of good businesses. I don't want to be wrong, but operating at a national level that would like that information they have in their in their database and as part of their platform. And they should be charging for that. They should be using that to fund their own startup and their next generation. So, yeah, let's line up a conversation around that. That'd be great. Sounds great. Well, this has been super fun. I loved riffing with you yeah. on these topics going wherever we go. But sticking around APIs. I mean, I would have never thought I would be having this conversation. So also thank you for reminding me how often I've touched APIs and used them in, in creating my businesses. Um, because no, I've, this, this is great. I mean, I, yeah, I and I appreciate having you on the show because you're asking me questions, which I, I really like. I don't like it just being me um, uh, interviewing and asking questions. So so you've been a great guest on that front and then everything else that we're spinning out from this. So uh, to be continued, I, I don't I don't think this is the last conversation we'll have. So, um, yeah, thank you for coming and joining and, and and having this conversation with me. Well, it was a pleasure. And if anyone follows up with you with an idea for this uh API for the kids space. Let me know. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, enjoy the rest of your day. Have a good weekend and, uh, and we'll be in touch. Sounds great. You too, Ken. Bye. Thanks again to Desiree for stopping by. You can find more about P33 at p33chicago.com and you can find Desiree on LinkedIn. You can subscribe to the Breaking Changes podcast at postman.com slash events slash breaking dash changes. I'm your host, Ken Lane, and until next time, cheers. Mm -hmm.